Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock, at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 447. Six-Player Games. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, we answer questions from the mailbag, including one listener who wants us to pick a fight with another podcast, and another who wants his game group to be more serious. Plus, we gather four more friends around the table for our top ten six-player games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the cousin Larry to my balky, Tom Vassell. Eh, once again, Eric's pop culture creeps in and I don't know what he's talking about. Sometimes the world looks perfect. Nothing to rearrange. Sometimes you just get a feeling like you need some kind of change. Oh, that was helpful. We're standing tall on the wings of our dreams. Oh my goodness. Rise why why do you think that if that phrase didn't give it to me, the next one would? On the would. wings of our dreams. It sounds like a soap opera. It was a sitcom, but yes. Soap? No, no, Perfect Strangers. Oh, I never watched that. Oh, man. I th- I'm okay, I think. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Just one little piece missing. That's fine. Really? I think we've gone through this. There's a lot of pieces missing from your half of the puzzle there, sir. It's, it's true, yes. I, I, will, I will admit. Uh, I, t- I was listening to one of Eric's favorite groups today, Rockapella. Ah, what were you listening to? Uh, just random pieces from them. Okay. I'm trying to build a playlist of songs, so I was going through their Spotify. I think they only have two CDs on Spotify. Hmm. And then there was another group that was also a Pella group, but it was not Rockapella. It was like Shacapella or something like that. Oh, that's interesting. Spacapella? Spacapella? Rockapella? Huh? Uh, those Spacapella would be singing Vulcans. Yes, there would be. Um, La Capella? Hmm. Va Capella? I have no idea. I don't remember what it was either. But, you know, I still treasure the Where in the World is Carmen San Diego soundtrack. That was not on Spotify. Hmm, that's way out of print. Hmm. Well, that's okay. Okay, folks, my name is Tom Vassell. Hello, I'm Eric Summerer. And that was getting precariously close to talking about not games for too long of a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what the length stopwatch. of time is. <laughs> but I do know that there are some podcasts that do it, and then I always see people say, they didn't talk about games for the first 15 minutes. I don't think we've ever done that. I don't believe we have either. We've gotten close, but yeah. You think we've ever even gone over five? Well, you, not you, you including tend to, this conversation? To, uh, you t- tend to nip it in the bud pretty quickly. <laughs> That's right. Down to business. Anyway, folks, we are here to talk about board games. Uh, I also want to remind you the cruise is getting lower. I think there is 79 rooms left. Hmm. Well, as of me recording this, there's there, there could be less. So we'll just cut that in half. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I, like, I do like that this has been a little bit more of a slow burn. There's still excitement. Things are still selling out. I think we definitely are going to be sold out by the time we we get even close to the cruise itself. But it's given people a little bit more time to think about it and consider it as a vacation option. And so it it just seems it's it's nice in comparison to Dice Tower Con, which has just been such a frenzy for tickets. It's nice to slow it down just a hair, just a hair. That's all. It should be interesting. I wonder if we will sell it next year quick, more quickly. Because this is the way the first Dice Tower Con was, too. Mm -hmm. It took a while to sell out, and then boom, sold out. And that was like 300 tickets. Yeah. That's because no one believed in us back then. Well, there's no pressure on us to make it a really fun time. (laughs) It's only a make-or-break event. But okay. Yay! Hey, board games. Have you played any, Eric? 
Uh, a few. It, things seem to have slowed down a little bit. It's been kind of crazy with with weather and illness and family events. But but yes, we got some gaming in. In fact, I finally broke out a game I picked up at Gen Con that I was really excited about and just never got to the table. And that's the expansion for Valley of the Kings. Uh, one of my favorite deck An builders. Expansion the slash standalone. Exactly. This can be played totally alone. Uh, in Valley of the Kings, it's a it's a deck building game in which you're trying to earn points by collecting cards, but then entombing them. You have to bury them in your tomb and in sort of sets. It's a set collection game in addition to a deck building game. And you acquire these cards from a pyramid. You ordinarily can only buy from the bottom row of the pyramid. There's three levels. And then the cards sort of collapse down and you can then purchase them or the next player can purchase the ones on the lower level. But there are cards that let you swap things around. And as you acquire these cards, you get these cool abilities, uh, which you can then use as actions uh, you can use each card either for its special action or for its gold value, which then lets you buy more cards. So the trick, the tipping point in this one is is getting these cool abilities, but in order to score the points for these uh, cards, you have to entomb them so they're no longer in your deck. So when do you start destroying your ability to do stuff? Um, there's also a very specific timer because the game ends when the deck runs out. Uh, and so you... You have to keep an eye on how much of the game you have left and make sure you have abilities to entomb more than just the one card you're able to normally in a turn so that you're able to score the cards you have. Uh, we played uh, the, the new Afterlife set, and I, I liked some of the new abilities. There's some new uh, twists on things, ways to manipulate the pyramid, uh, attack your opponents in in not terribly... You know, terrible ways, but you can sort of exchange cards with their discard piles. There's there's just ways to to mess with the whole uh, you know table state. But I was so concerned about collecting stuff that I didn't start burying those cards fast enough. You you get married to these abilities, and uh, and and I I just didn't didn't switch quickly enough. And the the guy to my right was uh, was plopping down cards more quickly than I could keep up with. I still love the game. I like the new sets. I don't know if I could really say that I like one more than the other. I I like them both. Uh, the new Afterlife set does come with a solo rule set where you can sort of try and challenge your top score, trying to uh, acquire each uh, one card of each type uh, to try and win and get a perfect score. I haven't tried it, but it seems interesting. You can also swap out sets from the original set in order to create a new unique experience. Still, a big thumbs up. Uh, one of my favorite deck building games, Valley of the Kings. This is the Afterlife set from AEG. Yeah, uh, I don't know which set I would say I like better. I actually sat down and compared them to each other. Ah, whatever. I'll just play both of them. Yeah, really, I, I what mean, you, you do could is you just put all play... the colors yeah. and just pick what... You're like, I'll take this red set, I'll take this purple set, I'll take this green set, and you're fine. Yeah. All right. I had a chance to play Walled City. This is from Mercury Games. Um, <laughs> we, we are currently recording this while Board Game Geek is down. I know. This is... <laughs> and you for, we forget sometimes how much we depend on that because yes. uh, I'll be like, oh, I'll just quick look that up. and Oh, no, I can't yeah. do that. So depending on Vassal Brain, which is slightly less reliable. Yes. But Walled City is a game about building the walls to a city. Oh, <laughs> it's shocking. Yeah. Actually, though, this game is, is really interesting because it is a game in which you are – it's an area control game. But in this game, you are determining the areas that are being controlled by building walls. Now, at first, I thought this was unique, but Z reminded me that Mexico also has this sort of thing going on in it. Hmm. But in this game, you each turn of the game, and the game is split into two distinct halves. First, you're building interior walls in the city, and then you're repairing the outside walls. So first, you, you build a wall. On, on the interior turn, you have four turns, and you build a wall. Somewhere where there's a spot for a wall to be placed. And then that wall, on both sides of that wall, you'll place different, you'll place nobles and peasants. And so you'll do that four times. And then after you place these walls, they will form different areas on the board. So a, some areas will con hold more than one space because no one built walls in between those spaces. Hmm. And then you just basically get points, five points for each area. But also each area has a die in it. That shows pips and a color, and then 
you add all the pips of the blue dice together, and that's the blue faction's power. And whoever has the most where there are blue gets points for those, too. So it's kind of interesting. The second half of the game, you build these outer walls. And if you don't build enough outer walls, all the nobles in the outer section will run away because they're wimps. And you also can move nobles into towers so they can control the towers and get points from that, too. So there's just different area control things on the board. You also pick a card, which lets you control a guild. It essentially gives you a special power you can use once for each half of the game. And there's a little bit of hidden information, but for the most part, a very solid, straightforward game. I was I was pretty impressed with it. Um, I like the idea of building the city. I like area control games anyway. And this one felt a little different than things I've played before. Hmm. That's Walled City. Did you like it more than Mexico? That's a good question. Until Z mentioned this thing, I hadn't even compared them. It's a little bit different. Mexico's kind of a fluid game. If you played Mexico... You will be fighting over different areas a little at a time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it. You move from area to area. In this one, you're looking at the whole board all at one time. Hmm. And in Mexico, I don't believe once an area is surrounded by walls or canals, I don't believe you're allowed to split it in half. That is true. In this one, you can do that. Okay. It's possible. So it's different. Uh, Which one? I don't know. Mexico is certainly more beautiful. That new version from Yellow is just gorgeous. Hmm. But I don't know which one I would pick over the other. But I like them both. I'm, I'm a big fan of that interactive area control. I have more than you do, so ha, ha, ha. Okay. Walled City. So some time ago, I backed the Kickstarter for Bomb Squad, a game from Tasty Minstrel Games, a cooperative game, a timed cooperative game. I still haven't gotten that to the table. But during the whole process, Tasty Minstrel came out and said, hey... Everybody who backed this Kickstarter, you're going to get a bonus card game that we're calling Bomb Squad Academy. Ah! Uh, and and I, I, I was I, like, I, uh, I, I fear for you, Eric. Yeah. Because in my in my uh, experience, every time they add one of these little games to the Kickstarter, it's always horrible. Ah. Well, um, I don't think that's the case here. Let's just let's just spoil the headline right off the bat. Uh, but in Bob Squad Academy, this is not a cooperative game. Uh, whereas Bomb Squad is, you are on a training mission. It's your final exam as you are working your way through the Bomb Squad Academy, and uh, you have a bunch of training bombs, four of them to be exact, and uh, it's blue, green, yellow, and red, and uh, you are trying to defuse them, or at least not be the one to set off the bomb. You have a series of action cards, six of them, one matching those four different bombs, uh, and they, are, they aren't all the same. So I think the blue bomb has the fewest little spaces. There's a deck of cards, and then there's a little track that says how close that bomb is to exploding. And each of these has its own track, but they're not all the same length. I think green is the shortest, then blue, then yellow, then red, I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh... And there's a different distribution of cards in those decks, uh, numbers, uh, ranging from, say, zero to some of them have fives in the deck. You have action cards, and you will simultaneously select one of these action cards, and you all flip them up. And if you chose, say, the green deck, you will pull a green card and flip it up, move the bomb tracker, that number of spaces listed on the card, and then you will get that number in the center of the card, as well as one point for each additional card that's already in that row. Uh, so the, the closer the bomb is to blowing up, or the more cards that have been played on that particular bomb, the more points you will get for trying to defuse it. However, if you uh, choose the same thing as somebody else, you will split the points for doing that. Plus, you're pulling two cards, or three cards, if three of you are trying to work on that bomb at the same time, which could make it significantly more dangerous to be working on that bomb. There is also a, a halt card that allows you to say, that bomb, uh, you're, not, you're not messing with that bomb this turn, so you're not getting any points. Uh, you can sort of prevent people from earning lots of points in a particular color. There's also a chicken card that says, I think somebody's causing something to explode this turn, uh, and if it does, you earn points. Once a bomb gets to the end of the track, there are three little tokens at the end that sort of keep it vague as to when the bombing, bomb exactly is going to explode. Uh, there, there's three tokens. One of them says the bomb explodes, and the other two say, okay, you're fine. And you shuffle these up at the beginning of a round, so you don't know exactly at what point in the track it's going to blow up. 
Once a bomb explodes, if you cause it to explode, you're going to lose points. But if you didn't, uh, you, you're safe. Um, and then you reset with a couple of minor tweaks. You get some equipment cards and some bonus points that sort of float around the board. And you play through three rounds. Most points wins. Uh, I did sort of a quick run-through of this the first time I brought it out. We didn't finish a complete game, and I was, I don't know, a little under-impressed. Uh, but playing through an entire round more recently, there is a good amount of tension here. Uh, there, there's that, that guessing game of what do I think you're going to choose. Oh, there's also a cycling of these action cards. So you, you play one in front of you, and then you're not allowed to pick that one back up again. It stays out on the table. So then you play another one on top of that, and then a third one on top of that, and then you get the first one back. So you always see two cards that are out on the table that people can't choose. So you have a little bit of information as to what they're going to to pick. And um, trying to make that decision of when do I pounce for one that may be more lucrative or one that is a safer bet, but I don't want to go there when everyone else goes there. It, there's that interesting decision point. And then as the bombs all sort of creep toward exploding, you don't have one that's safe anymore. And it, it gets tricky. Which one do I have to choose and just cross my fingers that somebody makes something explode before it gets to my turn? It was fun. Um, I, I liked it. it, it that, that tension is what it's all about. It's a little odd thematically, but, you know, it's supposed to be a training mission. Um, I found it fun. Bomb Squad Academy. Hmm. You have not convinced me, sir. Okay. But we'll see. We'll see. Hey, it, it's worth last, a look. Last week, I believe, Eric talked about Through the Ages. Was I that last week? I think I did. I've been, I'm still playing it online with, with Jeff and Ray. Jeff Engelstein? Jeff Engelstein was mean to me, but that's fine. Oh. Were, but, were you expecting that anything different? I, I mean, wasn't, you, but I did laugh the when the rats ate all of his food. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you winning? Uh, I think he and I are about neck and neck point-wise right now. Do you feel like you're going to win? I don't feel like I'm going to win. I, I think he's going to do something very nasty soon. But I'm, I'm yeah. trying. I'm still scrapping. I'm, I'm a scrappy guy. Well, I've played the new version of Through the Ages, uh, which just came out from CG. And first of all, it is head and shoulders above the original one component-wise. Mm. Wow. Better quality cards. Nice pictures pictures at all um the cubes i'm not the biggest fan of cubes but these translucent cubes are much nicer than the little tiny wooden discs that you had to poke with a needle hmm. to move in the first game they streamline parts of the game it's still a pretty long game uh, but man i forgot how much i like this game yeah i really like civilization games and this this one is you know, when I'm, I remember playing Nations a couple years ago, and I was like, ooh, maybe Nations will supplant through the ages. No. <laughs> no. Nations is fine, but through the ages is amazing. And it's just so much fun to play because you have so many different paths, so many different things to build. It's probably the game that comes closest to being like Civilization, the computer game, hmm. without the tactical maneuvering on the board. Right. It, it doesn't have no the map, board. which a lot of people do miss. Yeah. And I have to say that even though in Civilization I like going after my enemies and building empires, and, and through the ages, I'm always kind of like, come on now, knock it off. I'm trying to build an empire here. <laughs> Why are you attacking me? Yeah. Hey, back off. I'm working here. Yeah. And you could actually play a white, lily-livered um, version Pacifist. with no fighting. Oh, Okay. Which I would do, actually, because I do, I, you know, I just want to sit there and make my awesome. That's essentially a Euro game, though, at that point. Well, yeah. Uh, but if you've never played this, it's long, although it's not quite as long with two players, or you can always play it forever online like Eric is. That's true. Uh, but it is an excellent game. So that's Through the Ages, Through the Ages with CGE. Uh, speaking of Civ building, the last one is a blast from the past for me, and that's La Cita or La Cheetah. Uh, yes, I st- wait. Is that correct? I, you know, everyone always says La Chita, and I, I've never really, um, I've never confirmed it. I haven't talked to the designer or the publisher to know if that's exactly what it should be. Now, Eric said it, so because we just did our top ten civilization. I mean, our city building games. Yeah, and this was on my list. Okay, and I said La Chita, and then the other guys said that I was pronouncing it incorrectly. But I think I was right. Uh, that's just always been the word of mouth thing. But you know, it's one of those things that I. I've never checked and, and figured it out. So, hey, you know, 
if, if somebody knows for sure what it's supposed to be, I'd love to know. Oh, hey, future Eric here. I, I just happened to be looking up some words for my next audiobook while I'm editing, trying to multitask. But uh, I looked up on Google Translate, and it is La Chita. So I guess Tom and I are right. Cool. Anyway, in La Chita, uh, you are managing uh, more than one little city. Uh, you start with two at the beginning of the game, and the map is, is sort of little paths surrounding triangular sections. It's a hex map, uh, and all of these triangular sections have resources on them. And um, you can do a, a sort of preset setup, or you can do a random setup where you get to choose your starting locations. And these uh, triangular sections have food, they may have water, they may have ore on them. And you will place your initial cities, and uh, you get little dudes, little plastic people uh, that represent your population for these zones. And, and the population allows your city to expand. You will then spend actions, you get five actions in a round, to expand your city. And uh, you can not only do some basic actions, which give you new little tiles, and uh, you'll have to place one of your guys on each of your cities each time you do this. So you can only grow as large as your population allows. But you can also use action cards to um, use or to create better buildings. Each of these buildings, most of them, have little arches on them in blue, white, and black, representing culture and education and uh, cleanliness, medicine. And each round of the game, each set of five actions, there will be a voice of the people, these, these face-down cards, four face-down cards, that uh, say this is what the people want. And you see one of them at the beginning, and there are action cards that let you peek at the face-down cards. But ordinarily, these won't be revealed until the end. So you're building your little towns. And as you get close to other people's towns, you begin to compete with them. And each round, when the voice of the people is revealed, you may find out that culture is the thing that the people want. And then you go around and look at each, each city... And if you have more culture than your neighbors and you're close enough to compete, you will actually draw population from them. Which sounds awesome because population ultimately is victory points. However, you have to feed your people. I think this is at least my first first encounter of the feed your people mechanism. And, and it never went away. It's possible that you could have an awesome round and draw in a ton of people and then find out you can't feed them. And uh, there's a pretty big penalty for that. You lose an action in the subsequent round, or if it's the last turn of the game, you lose five points because you can't feed your people. So it is, as the board fills up, it's a tremendous struggle for not only the resources on the board, but also to keep yourself alive if you find yourself lacking in some of these services that you know your, your opponents, your neighbors are doing better than you. And uh, it's, uh, it's very tricky to balance all of that and, and to dig yourself out if you've miscalculated. Um, you, you need certain buildings. You need a, a fountain if you want to grow beyond a certain size. And it's possible to, to grow so much that you can no longer grow any bigger because you don't have the ability to put in a public bath or a fountain. Um, it, it's neat. It's a neat game. A little, it shows a little bit of its cracks. Um, there's, there's a good amount of luck involved in what action cards come up. Like if you never get a chance to pull the people and see those face down cards, you, you just don't get a chance to do it because the guy in front of you always gets a chance to do it. You never see those cards. There's no way for you to know and you just never have that knowledge in the game. Or if, if you really need to build the triple white arch building and you just can't because the card isn't available or the master builder card, sort of the wild card, never comes up on your turn. So that sort of thing can feel a little clunky and fiddly. Um, and there are tons of little people. These little people are, are tricky to move around and count. In fact, a guy in our group made a chart, sort of a scoreboard, to keep track of everybody's food production and their population so you didn't have to keep counting all the people all the time, which I thought was a really nice addition. I still like it. It's not near, it's not quite as streamlined as more modern games, but it's still still a lot of fun. La Chita or La Cita. I liked it. Yes, it's a good game. All righty, let's take a look at Cancel of Four. This is from Cranio Creations. And when I saw the cover of this box and the game on the back, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll get around to that. Mm -hmm. And then proceeded to not get around to it. Now, I did not realize that this game was designed by the same team that did Marco Polo. 
Hmm. Which is a game that I slightly enjoy. By slightly, yeah. I mean a lot. Mm. And when I played Council of Four, halfway through, I was like, this is an amazing game. Huh. And it really is. Council of Four is, uh, there are different regions on the board that have four counselors on them that are of different colors. And you're drawing cards into your hand that match these colors. And so on your turn, you can take a title to one of these areas if you have the four colors that match the council of four in that area, or you can change one of the counselors to a color you like, or you can do it with only three cards and then pay more money or two cards and pay even more money, so on and so forth. It's a pretty simple game. It's get cards I mean, or get these uh, titles, which give you bonuses, and then use these titles to build a city on in, uh, or a, a building in one of the cities on the board. When you build a building in a city on the board, you get some point. Or you, you you get a bonus. So the the bonus might be getting some points, getting some money, getting some more cards, moving on a track that gets you money, points, and cards, and things like that. That's pretty typical Euroy stuff. But where the game is fascinating is when you build into a city, you also get the bonus of any city that that city is connected to. Hmm. And you also get the bonus of any cities that those cities are connected to. Whoa. Which means as the game progresses, you can place a house and go, bonus, 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 bonus. And it's super fun. Hmm. Like it. I love chain reactions of joyous happiness. <laughs> it's fun to do this. The game plays quick on your turn. You're going to build a house or you're going to get some money. I mean, there's not, a, there's not many different actions you can do. But you're trying to race the other players and get as many points as you can. The first person to build, uh, like, for example, a house in two blue cities gets a whole pile of bonus points. And you think, wow, how can we ever beat this person? Until you realize that if you buy building houses together and getting bonuses, you can slowly catch up. It's a little bit similar to, like, in Lords of Waterdeep. You know, the first time someone builds a 25-point card, mm. you're like, how can we ever beat them? Yeah. And then you realize, oh, well, we can. <laughs> and that's the way this game felt, too. I was so impressed by this one. This, do not judge this one by its cover. This is an excellent game. I feel confident it's coming to America. I feel, like, really confident on that regard. Hmm. Um, so that's Council of Four from Cranial Creations. Let's get to some questions. Let's do it. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Vassal. Mr. Vassal. Mr. Vassal. Mr. Vassal. Tom. Tom Vassal, will there be a Dice Tower theme park? If you were a die, what sort of die would you be? Will there be a Vicious Fishes movie? And now the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, 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 Tom, uh, uh, which way to the bathroom? So Brantley would like to know uh, about a, uh, a friend in their group who turns into a silly gamer. For example, they're, they're playing Bring Out Your Dead. And he was doing everything in his power to throw his coffins in the river. Or they played legendary encounters. He was the traitor, but decided to continue to play the game normally and just make jokes about their character cheating on their taxes. We really love this guy, says Brantley. I mean, he bought us all board games for Christmas. We don't want to just tell him not to play with us, but he is very difficult to ring in. He takes nothing seriously. Hmm... Actually, I think throwing all your coffins in the river and... Yeah, isn't that the point? Bring out your dead could get you a lot of <laughs> points if you do it right. <laughs> um, Yeah, what do you do when you have that guy who just... They goof off. And goofing off is fine to some degree, right. right? But when you goof off in a serious game, you actually will mess with other people's enjoyment. Right. Of One it. of my buddies likes to, in Robo Rally, just head to the, the first upgrade station and just get whatever weapons they can whether they're heading toward a flag or not. I'm just going to get weapons. Let's do this thing. And then messes with everybody. I suppose, in this instance, when I was pulling out a game like this, I would say, I apologize, but you can't play this game. <laughs> because you won't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I, maybe if you have multiple tables, you can do that. Oh, well, if you have less, then you can. I would have to sit down and say, "Look, you're you're not invited to game night. Thanks for the board games for Christmas. <laughs> We're not playing them with you." <laughs> uh, that's so hard. Mm. Yeah, you got to talk to him. 
If it's really bothersome, you need to say yeah. it. And you need to say it not during a game and not in a joking way. Yeah. Because they'll think, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's not that serious. If it's a really serious deal, you need to, to talk to them mm-hmm. about it. Yeah, it definitely needs to be discussed. Um, it's an interpersonal thing. It's just a perspective difference. I mean, this this friend is there to have fun. You're all there to have fun. But the level of fun that the rest of the group wants is different from what friend A wants. All right. Now we have a bunch of questions from Eric. Not me. I'm, I, until I see other proof. <laughs> you think I just I sent these in to stir up trouble? I don't know. If each of you had an arch nemesis amongst the other Dice Tower contributors, who would it be and why? Huh. Well, I... I uh. See, well, I've got my sir, mean answer. Is it me? No. That's not mean. I just delete it. It's Greg Schlosser for uh, mic quality. Oh. <laughs> well, it, it used to be Ryan Sturm, right? Um... But he hasn't done anything for a while. Yeah. Uh, maybe Brian Counter. <laughs> Although, because he's cold of the old and I'm cold of the new. No, maybe. The problem is, is that Brian's so nice that you, no one can be his no, arch nemesis. No, that, that's true. So I'll go with... It's not like I have a, a, a wide variety of choices here. Dan King. Hmm. Okay. And I have no I have no thing for that. I just talked to him on the phone today, so I'm just saying this to get his goat. <laughs> All right. Well, forget that. What if we had an arch nemesis among other gaming podcasts? What would it be and why? This guy really wants us to fight. He really does. Um, uh, Jared Geek Hunnefeld speak. from Flip the Table. He knows oh, yeah, why. Okay, that, that's true. We'll make them our official arch nemesis. He the knows flip why. Flip the Table, guys. You're right. Huh. <clears throat> Then he wants to know, are game tables a luxury, a practicality, or a necessity? (laughs) (laughs) I love the fact that necessity is in there. Yeah, we can cross that one off, I think. At what point should someone decide to get one, and what factors should go to that decision? I got one for you. Money. (laughs) Disposable income. (laughs) They are definitely a luxury. Unless you're talking about, like, just buying a small table for gaming, then that's a practicality. Yeah. I, but it's, I, I'm considering one, a purchase, in, in the next few years. Once my kids get a little bit older and stop stabbing the table with metal forks, um, when we, we do consider getting a new table, I, I will consider a gaming one that can be used as our dining table as well. Ooh. Yeah. But it's still luxury. It, it's still, it's, a, it's an upgrade to a necessity, or upgrade from a necessity, but it's certainly not on its own a necessity. Each of you seems to have a rather large game co- collection. Where do you each draw the line for too many games? Hmm. Space for me. Space. Yeah, and that's really what it is. And I, again, have crossed that line some time ago. I, I'm in the process of trying to do a major cull. Con uh, Con is coming up next month, and there's a, a, an auction coming up. I'm trying to get, get games ready for that sort of thing as quickly as I can. I need to get things out of the house so I can walk on the floor. I'm up to 31 boxes. Oh, man. Yeah. But here, here's, the, here's the deal in, in, in that regard is I just picked a random amount of space and on my, one wall in my, in my game room, mm-hmm. and that's what I have. Yes. I have not gone over that. If it gets close, I'll cut some games out of it. I actually have like three or four empty shelves on it now, so I have plenty of room to add for a while without subtracting. Nice. Eric sounds like one of those addicts. Yeah, I'm going to do it <sighs> tomorrow. I know. I've said this Soon. for some time. You know, Soon I'm going to get rid of some games. I promise. What I need to do is get my wife's stamping stuff out of that room. Because then I can fit more games in there. But that's, a let's say, a delicate situation. And this was the last episode Eric was on. I, she's not home right now, so she doesn't hear this. I'm texting her as the, we Do speak. not... <laughs> and and those of you oh wait she's coming to Dice Tower Con okay don't don't talk to her about this okay just just, just shh, shh. Uh, Eric I I thought you were old enough <laughs> all right uh, what country in your opinion is consistently producing the best games currently oh my um France maybe uh, 
I mean, uh, you know, Czechoslovakia was was putting out a lot of great stuff. Yeah, but there's some small Czech companies that are bringing that average down. Okay. <laughs> um, Poland's all over the map. Germany's all over the map. USA's all over the map. Uh, England, I don't have enough data points from them, I think. Mm. Japan's all over the map. Mm. There's no country that's consistently good. Well, yeah. So I'll just say France. What country has the best game designers? Canada. Okay, because that's where Eric Lang lives. Shot it. <laughs> um, all right. Do you know anyone who uses foreign language editions of games to help learn that language? Um, do you? Hmm. I never heard of that. I do know that back in the day, like 15 years ago or so, there were guys who were learning German so they could play these new, we call them German games, well, sure. Euro games back then. Yeah. And I always thought, are you kidding me? You, you learn enough German to be able to decode the rule books. Of all the reasons to learn another language, playing board games seems to be the a, best reason. a high one up there. Oh. Well. Although I was just talking to Z and Sam about this today is we no longer have this problem. It used to be, because they're about to announce the Spiel des Jahres uh, nominees and stuff, and I was looking at some of the nominees for, for the Cannes Festival, the Can Gaming Festival, mm -hmm. and I said, I'm going to go look at these nominees, and I'm going to know every game. Hmm. It didn't used to be that way. Yeah, there used to be big surprises, especially like the Kinderspiel. Uh, those are usually a big surprise. Well, that's still, I always don't know those. But for, but for the regular games, they, they're being published in English somewhere. It's just not that big of a deal anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, using them, he, the second part is, do you know of anyone using English language editions as ESL tools? I did when I was over in Korea yeah. all the time. And many teachers there did too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't see why uh, it wouldn't work in the other direction. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people use stuff like code names or, um, or Dixit uh, as, as ways to explore language. Um, you know, it, it forcing ESL students to use English to describe things in these sorts of games is good to learn the subtleties of the language. All right. Well, that's all the questions from Eric. His last one we've answered a million times. So <laughs> let's keep going. Adam uh, is asking about Dice Masters, including the upcoming DC War of Light. We're up to seven different versions of Dice Masters at this point. Obviously, your answer will be out of date soon, considering the breakneck pace at which WizKids is tossing out releases. But I'm curious to know if favorites have surfaced for you. So here are my questions. What's your favorite set with regard to mechanics? What's your favorite set with regard to theme? Okay, so we probably know it's Marvel, but which one? And do you have a single favorite card or die across the sets? What is it and why? Um, well, you can see how far behind we are in questions because <laughs> there is now 10 sets. Okay. <laughs> uh, the upcoming set is the DC... Um, Oh, I forget the name of it now. Batman and Superman set. Hmm. Anyhow, um, my favorite set for mechanics is probably the Dungeons and Dragons two sets. Oh, okay. With theme, <sighs> probably the Spider-Man set. I really like the Spider-Man one, hmm. the one that just came out. Uh, my favorite card or die across all the sets. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, right now, I'm really loving on Kryptonite. Hmm. Um, I also like Mr. Mixoplex. Mixoplex. You know how to pronounce his name? Mixoplex. Yeah. I think it's a little bit different than that. Mr. Mixoplex. That's the way they said it on Super Friends. Okay. You shouldn't be talking about Super Friends. You should be talking about the Avengers of Batman and Superman. But yes. Okay. Or the Justice League. So anyhow, um... Uh, there's a lot, though. I would have to sit down and figure out my favorite ones from there. I'll figure it out at some point. Our next question comes from Jeremy. This is for Eric. Ah. Do you still play the version of Merchants of Venus that you constructed? Do you still have it? Still have it, yes. Still play it, no. Um, I, I built this when Merchant of Venus was out of print, and I did not have an original copy. Uh, and I bought it, or I, I built it so that I could play the game. And, and it's... It's sturdy, but it's still a little fragile. I mean, the, the board is actually a photo print, like a poster photo print from Walmart. Um, it, it was sort of cobbled together from other things. I've even taken some of the pieces and used them in the other two editions that I have now. I now have an original Avalon Hill 
and the New Fantasy Flight Edition, and those are my play copies. Uh, I use the original one uh, sort of as my travel copy because it's smaller and lighter, and at local conventions I'll play with the Fantasy Flight or even both if I'm doing like a major event. And I've, I think I've stripped out the dice from the set I built and, and some of the other pieces. So it just isn't as usable a set as it once was. And it, frankly, isn't as, as pretty. Um, I mean, the board is cool, but as far as the pieces and the components and the way it's all put together and the construction, it just isn't as solid as a, an actual professionally produced edition of the game. So no... Uh, it, it doesn't hit the table very much anymore. Jim struggles to get his wife to play board games, and he thinks a lot of listeners may empathize with this. I know that lots of women enjoy this hobby. However, is it fair to say that it's an overwhelmingly male-dominated industry? So why do you think that playing board games is primarily a guy thing? I don't really know why, uh, other than that women were not made to feel welcome for many years. Yeah, I think that's, that's a lot of it. So I would say that dominance is slowly changing. Someone was just asking me today about, or I got an email from someone who said, could I list like women who were executives at companies? Hmm. And I said, uh, well, the owner of F2Z, which is one of the biggest companies, is a female. Mm-hmm. And uh, half of the owner of um, uh, who makes uh, Castle Panic? Uh, that's Fireside Games. Fireside Games. Uh, a lot of the uh, higher ups at Asmo Day. That's correct. Um, and so there are female exec- and there's a, there there's several others. Ad Magic is owned by a female. Mm-hmm. So there's executives in the female in the gaming business of female executives, but not not as many as there should be, and there's not nearly as many designers. But hopefully that we're starting to see that change and swing around. I certainly we're feel definitely that way. seeing it happen in players. Yeah, I mean, but if you go to a convention, uh, uh, it, you see a lot more of that mix approaching fifty percent. It, it may be more like thirty, forty percent. It is. I counted Origins two years ago and got thirty okay. percent. Just my unofficial pull of me walking. Um, Essen is the highest percentage of females, for sure. Okay. Um, and then I would say smaller conventions are the second highest, it seems, usually. Hmm. I, just, I remember there being a lot at TotalCon. Yeah. I mean, it just, it, there are a lot of very active ladies in this, in this hobby. In my house, it's higher than 50%. Well, <laughs> that's, that is true. But we, we can hope that this changes. Uh, Jim's second question is, uh, when choosing player colors like Meeple's, uh, he always plays as orange. What colors do the Dice Tower guys play as? And does it annoy or confuse you when someone else plays as the color that you normally do? I know that recently when I got to play with you, Tom, you got upset that I was grabbing purple all the time. Well, your reasoning was dumb. What, because purple is awesome? No, you, pick, you said, oh, my wife likes purple. Like that? It, what? Your wife was not playing the game. Is that what I said? I don't think I said that. No, nah, it's actually that's someone. That's another one of my. Oh, friends. okay. He would always say, "Well, my wife's favorite color is purple, so I guess I'll play that." I'm like, well, too bad, Jane here. Yeah, I'm playing. I, it. I'm purple. Pick a different color. I will always play purple if possible. However, that's like in like twenty percent of games. Yeah, purple is not as common a color as it should be. In most games, it's red, yellow, green, blue, mm-hmm. and then white or black. Uh, and so Sam always takes green and Z always takes yellow. And if, even if they're not there, I just don't take those colors because they always do. Uh-huh. So I end up then picking whatever colors left over and I don't care what color I am. However, if we go from one Euro game to another Euro game, yeah. I insist everyone stay the same colors yes. if, if possible. If that's possible. It's really annoying when you're red in one game and then you switch and you're blue in the next. Mm-hmm. And then you like do a move and you're like, oh, look at that move. It really helped out red. Oh, wait. I'm not red. That's, yeah. And that's why I actually do like to play purple if it's available because I'm just so used to it so that if Eric is playing purple, I'm like, oh, that's right. Eric's that purple guy. Yeah, well, that's why I chose it so that you'd help me out. I, I thought a good guest would defer to the host. That doesn't make <laughs> any sense. It's the host deferring to the guest. <laughs> I understand that. Shut it. Yeah, my, my typical hierarchy is purple if I can get it, then orange if purple's not available. Uh, and then if I have to go with one of the basic colors, usually yellow. I'll go with the one that people don't really gun for. 
Um, and so I'll often go with yellow. Uh, that, that, that tends to be one that's left over or, or black or white. Uh, I, we What's did have a guy in our group play? that insisted on playing blue. And one time somebody said, no, I, I, I chose first. It's, it's my turn to choose first. I'm being blue. And the guy threw a tantrum and like wanted to leave. So it is possible to be a little too married to your preferred color. Is that when you decided to start playing purple instead of blue? And, yeah, that's it was it was secretly me. No. It's a nice color if you can get it. Yeah. All right. Steven has a double barreled question for us. Ooh. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> yes. Oh, the dice tower. Uh, I just turned 50 this year, says Steven, and still enjoy playing board games. That's good. Yeah, good. <laughs> I turned 50. You know what? I'm done. <laughs> anyway, he says he doesn't win many, but at what age? Oh, that's actually his that's question. That's his question, yeah. Do you think it's a good age to stop playing board games? Oh, wow. <laughs> or do you think that playing board games is good for the mind when I get older? Yeah, keep playing. Uh, I think I would play board games until... I'm senile. And even then, Eric will come play board games with me, and he'll always win. Yes. <laughs> I'll be like, what color am I again? Purple. Eric's like, you're purple. <laughs> I'm like, oh, of course. Five minutes later, what color am I again? Yellow. <laughs> oh, okay. Did I move yet? Uh, yes. Yes, you did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll just go. I'll take a turn now. And don't forget, you gave me that property. Yeah. You, you said you, we would uh, we'd trade. Yeah, I think definitely uh, keep keep playing as long as you possibly can, uh, and and I I do think research shows that that people who uh, play you know mind jogging games uh, you know continue with that sort of skill set. It's a good thing to do. Keep playing, Stephen. It is. Yeah, I I've never actually heard of somebody who said, "I am now at a certain age. I am done with board games." Yeah. I mean, other than. Like, I'm now 18. I'm going to college. This is too childish for me. Yeah. I've seen people do yeah, stuff true. like that before. I have met, uh, or, we've met a few people at conventions who are retired, and they can, you know, this is their retirement activity is that they'll travel from convention to convention and, and they can fill their schedule with, you know, a few every couple of months and, and really can enjoy the hobby and, and enjoy their free time doing that. I really envy those people uh, to be able to. To devote so much time to their hobby. So keep playing, Stephen. Do it. The unfortunate thing for me and Eric is that we will never actually retire. (laughs) Both our jobs have no retirement plans in place. That's very true. And so Eric will still be doing voice work. Yeah, he will be different voice work to be like, oh, we need a cranky old man to do this commercial. Eric will be like, oh, you can do that now. I can do that. No problem. Um, And I... I'll, I'll still be reviewing board games, I guess. Or I just won't know I'll watch them anymore. They'll be like, Tch. I'm not watching that old guy teach games. He doesn't know the camera's not on. Just let him do it. <laughs> I'm in a room. Kids, I made 60 reviews today. My kids are like, yeah, good job, Dad. <laughs> you should see all the comments you got on Brain Tube. <laughs> They're just pieces scattered all over the room because he keeps doing the component drops, but he can't bend over to pick them up. Oh, I picked it up. Okay, we're really getting off topic here. <laughs> we are. Yeah, we're punchy already. We should move on. It's a Dice Tower Top Ten. The Dice Tower's Top Ten list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Hey, six hey. players split into two groups, but... <laughs> Actually, six players is that very awkward moment in many times. In it is It is an awkward moment because a lot of six-player games tend to be a little more unwieldy than, than smaller size games. And some people really don't like them. They don't want to fit that many people around the table and try and play all together. Uh, so you are faced with that decision. Do you play a game that doesn't always appeal to everybody? Or do you split into a three and three? Or sometimes someone's bring, brought a pretty cool two-player game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is actually the optimal move there, I think, because then they can play their two-player game and everyone else can play a good, solid four-player game. Yeah, maybe. I've seen that happen before. 
But with six, I'm always like, is there anyone else around here who wants to play a game? And it, oh, seven. Perfect. Four yeah. and three. Seven is split. Seven, I'll be like, oh, we can't. I'm not playing a seven player game. Sorry, yeah. guys. Our group leader sort of frowns on the uh, the two four split because it, it, I guess it's just sort of a, a feeling like, well, if you're going to play a two player game, you could have just stayed home and played with that one person instead of getting together with our group. But once well, or twice, yeah, I've, but it's I've, not like they're playing two player games all night. They're just doing it for that one session. Right. I frown at your group leader. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure you would. No, I am frowning at him now. Oh. Okay. He can't see it. He probably doesn't listen to our show. No, I don't think he does. But if he does, I frown in your general direction. Yeah, you hear it, you hear it, Joe? It, you just, it's oh, it's frowning. Joe. That's right. I might see him this year. All right. Let's get started. Now, on my top ten six player games, I left out party games on purpose because, you know, I could just populate the whole thing with six player games. Yeah, okay. Uh, party games, you can always play party games with six players, right? Almost every party game works with six players. So yes. I was like, ah, all right, well, let's leave those off. I'm saying, do you want to play something somewhat substantial with six players? Sure. Uh, I guess um, I have a couple that could be considered party, but they are the more cerebral party games. That is correct. And, well, we got some that some people consider to be party games, too, for other reasons. But Okay. And one of us has a bad game on our list. Oh, all right. great. Yes, I, I, I see what you just spotted. All right. Let's do it. Number 10. Let's kick things off with Colt Express, the game where you are uh, on a train and you've got all your little dudes running around and you do this sort of pre-programmed movement thing and then you resolve these movements and chaos ensues um, because not you don't have perfect information. You're going through tunnels and playing cards face down and you may think you're waltzing into a car with nobody else there and punching a guy and, uh, and uh, picking up some loot, but instead you end up not in the same car because somebody punched you and moved you into another car and you got shot and now you're in the room with the marshal and he shoots you and chaos ensues. Uh, more players mean more of that chaos in Colt Express, my number 10. Good choice. I almost put it on my list, but I did not. Instead, my number 10 is Citadels. Citadels! Thank you. I haven't done one of those in a while. Wow. I do not put this on the list to get Eric's goat. Although I thought about that. Mm-hmm. But I think Citadels, I mean, even though Citadels does go to seven, I really do like it with six. I like it with five, too. But six is a good number. Although with six, I still play to seven buildings rather than eight. Hmm. With six, almost every role is in play. Not all of them are. There's a couple left out, so that works for me. Um, it's a classic game. There is a game that has slightly bumped it on my list, which you I may hear about shortly. <laughs> so my number 10 from Fantasy Flight Games and Bruno Faduti, Citadels. Number nine. There aren't too many co-ops that fit six. There are there are a good number. Uh, and, and Flashpoint Fire Rescue, my number nine, is one of those. And and I, I like the the team up nature with the um the different roles in Flashpoint. It, it, it seems like the roles are very specific. They, they fit you into real jobs. You have to play to your strengths in Flashpoint. And so you get that cooperative nature. I'm going to go to the truck. I'm going to shoot the water gun at this quadrant. You better get out of You get in there and you get the hazmat materials and get out quickly. And you, you, you just take care of, uh, you know, taking care of the, the, the flare-ups. And, and you go in there and you treat people and carry them out. And, and so it really feels like a cooperative of enterprise and again having more people to have as many of those different jobs and strengths in the mix as possible is is really a fun way to play flashpoint it's fun at, at the lower player counts as well but having a whole team together is pretty cool my number nine flashpoint fire rescue my number nine has replaced citadels for me in many many ways and that is libertalia libertalia can play i think as low as two for sure And actually, I don't mind it with three, but six works pretty well in Libertalia, where you're playing pirate crews, and everyone's playing a pirate at the same time, and then you resolve them, and you see what happens. 
It's very entertaining. And I think, you know, sometimes these games slow down with six players. This one does not. And it has a lot of the cool interaction between player powers that Citadel's had, except the variety and Libertalia is much greater. Also, amazing artwork. Fun pirate game, Libertalia. Cool. Number eight. My number eight is one of those cerebral party games, and that is Dixit. Um, Dixit's okay with smaller player counts, but, but the nature of the game is that sort of misdirection. Or um, somebody naming, uh, you know, trying to describe their card, and then somebody else saying, well, this card works with that description as well. You want to have lots of options in Dixit. And so having the full player count of six cards on the table and trying to figure out which one is actually the storyteller's card with five other cards on the table... That That is the way this game should be played. Um, I have not played any of the versions with more players. That I th- what is it, Odyssey, uh, that plays with more players than, than the normal six? But six, I think, is a great number for Dixit. Uh, and, and you want that higher player count. My number eight, Dixit. Yeah, I would have considered this had I been doing party games. Hmm. My number eight is Horse Fever. I love racing games. I love racing games where you can bet on horses. I love racing games where you can bet on horses and then stick hot peppers in their mouths. <laughs> I'm not actually sure where the hot pepper went. But it doesn't matter because I can mess with your horse. Ha, ha, ha. This game is silly fun, but when the person is rolling the dice and the actual horse race goes, the horse that you've bet on and things, you're all cheering and yelling. Slightly more complex, needs to be streamlined a bit. This is a, a cranial creation game that's just begging to be in a nice, cool, streamlined package. But still a lot of fun. That's Horse Fever. Number seven. Number seven is a variant for a ticket to ride. That's uh, If you have the Asia map, Legendary Asia, you can play the partnership game with six players. You've got somebody sitting next to you, and you have a rack in between the two of you, and you can assign cards to that rack that both of you can use. Um, But you're not allowed to communicate directly as to what you what you're doing, uh, what you personally are trying to do versus what your partner is trying to do. So uh, you you can try and communicate based on the cards you're sharing what you're trying to do, uh, but they may misinterpret that. Uh, and, and trying to work with that partner in a nonverbal way while working with you know, against all of the other partnerships on the table is an interesting challenge, an interesting variant for Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride Legendary Asia, my number seven. I, I certainly considered this one. Uh, I, it's a lot of fun to play with teams. Although I think it's almost as fun playing with four in this version, too. Still with the partnership. Maybe more fun with four. Hmm. Well, you know, we could have did a list of games that aren't as good with six players. <laughs> okay, then I was it's, thinking, it's pushing this it is too much. Si- this is the one version of Ticket's Ride to add six and it worked out okay, but like Small World, when they added the six player, did not work out okay. Mm. My number seven, Sam and Z would be raising me on their shoulders if they were here (laughs) because I'm saying Jamaica. A pirate racing game. Simple, fun. Some of the best artwork ever in games. Panorama cards. uh, Cool ships. uh, Getting loot. Shooting at each other. But in essence, still just a race game. Everyone has the same die rolls, though. You just have to play cards that match these rolls and play them the right way and fight off the other pirates entertaining and fun um still selling today i think my number seven jamaica that sounds like fun you haven't played jamaica still no you could have played it when you were here i could have that should have been one of the ones we played Anyway, number six, number six, we sync up. And that is the the classic gateway. This makes so many lists, Uh, gateway games, filler games, uh, just simple games for families, easy to teach, easy to learn for sale. And having the reason why you want to have as many people as possible is to to spread out the the various cards that come out in those those, especially the later rounds. You want to have a good swath of cards uh, to, to compete for the different values of checks in that second round. If you get you know, fewer numbers of players, there's a greater chance that you end up with a, a, a swath that's like all really high payouts or all really low payouts. Those aren't quite as interesting, um, and it allows people to ditch cards that they don't want to have to, uh, to, to compete with. But if you get a larger swath of cards with a greater variation, uh, it makes those decisions a little bit more tense. So I like the greater player counts for for sale. 
Well, Eric stole my thunder there. <laughs> That's why I get to talk first. I, 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 am, I am finding this odd how many times we're matching on the same number. It is weird, isn't it? And, and it's totally, it's not, I don't see your list before I make mine. But we'll never know that because my list is there for you to see. It is true, but I have made, well, I, do, you, do I need to do some sort of oath? <laughs> we need to know, Eric. There, do I, I need to take a picture of my handwritten list with like that day's newspaper? <laughs> do you make the list before today? I did. Really? Then yeah, made I made it last night. me, I think. Last I night I made it. This morning. Well, anyway, Eric's right. Whenever I have six players, I'm always thinking, uh, oh, yeah, we can always play for sale. Hey, guys, we can play for sale while we're trying to think of a <laughs> two, three-player game to split into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sale. Great game. Number five. Number five, I could I can see some pushback on because uh, the higher player counts of Eclipse uh, would, would add some time to the game. But this is another one where I really appreciate the interaction of all the different player powers and having the full... Um, you know, the, the setup of Eclipse is based on the number of players and you sort of you want to have a symmetrical number so that it's fair who you're you're facing up against. And if you have the full six, you're surrounding the center space and everybody's spread out in a nice way and you can interact with everyone evenly uh, with your, your neighbors. And so the interaction of the powers and the interaction spatially on the board, I think, works well for Eclipse being a, a strong six player game. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you here. Mm. I think Eclipse is fine. Six, though, is a lot of people to play this game with. I've seen people do this with nine. It's possible to combine sets and really go yes. nuts. I highly argue against this with all people. Like, hey, we were playing this at a convention, and we decided to play Twilight Imperium with 15 people. Mm-hmm. Well, you're insane. <laughs> But you know what? If you're having fun, then go ahead and be insane all you want. But don't tell people that's a good idea. And you can't justify a player count by saying, well, someone did more. Like if I said, oh, I decided to play Memoir 44 with 30 people. And you'd be like, what? I'd be like, yeah, well, I knew a guy who played 40. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyhow. All right. My number, where are we? Five is flick them up. Oh, six is great. Teams of three on three. Hmm. And usually there's six cowboys, it seems, like in many of the scenarios. So you can each have two cowboys. Ah, oh, I love flick them up. Love flicking the discs. This seems to show up in a lot of my lists lately, doesn't it? Yeah, you, It is. does seem to be a favorite for you. Yeah, but I can't help it. It really is a good six-player game. I'm sticking with it. Flick them up. <laughs> Number four. Number four is my other cerebral party game. That's Code Names. Uh, and six players allows you to have one clue giver and two uh, receivers on each team. And, and I, I think it's important to have more than one person on the other side receiving the clue. So you get that discussion and you get that disagreement which is where the real fun comes in how you interpret the clues because maybe one person will get it and maybe the other one uh, doesn't quite, you know, it has a totally different interpretation that may make perfect sense. And that that's where the real fun of code names lies is, is trying to figure out which interpretation is the better one of the clues that you're hearing. So I think it's, I think it's good. That, that is the sweet spot for code names is having six people, three on each team. My number four, code names. Yeah, my number four is Ultimate Warriors. You played Ultimate Warriors, didn't you, Eric? I, I did with you, yeah. Didn't we beat you up in that game? Uh, it's likely. I think we all got beat up. I think I died. I still like that game a lot. I like how everyone has a little bit different of a feel, how you could be the small, very feisty guy who's hard to hit, or the big guy who everyone hits, but still might still win the game because he has so many hit points. Different special powers, but pretty simple. This is a game that I'm still surprised isn't getting more buzz because it plays six. Okay. And the game doesn't really take that much longer since everyone is playing in the same round. I mean, a six-player game is going to take longer than a three-player game, but there's also more people to go around and hit, too. Mm -hmm. So you don't get picked on as much in a six-player game. That's Ultimate Warriors. Number three. Power Grid is my number three. Uh, I like having the full table, the full complement for this, because uh, I like 
the market nature of this game, as as people sort of shift from which power plants they are focusing on, uh, the more you have of people shifting those focuses, uh, the more you're going to to get the, the the constant jockeying. If you only have a few people playing Power Grid, yes, it moves faster. There is certainly that. The, the sixth player is going to last a little longer. Um, but you can have people that, that are able to sort of corner the market in a particular resource. You'll get one guy who's the trash guy, and then you'll get one guy who's, who's in oil and one guy who's in trash, and that doesn't change as much. But when you have six people, you can't really corner the market on anything, and you have to watch out for people horning in on your territory. And then when too many people shift in that one direction, then you need to get a power plant that does something that other people aren't doing as much. And that churning is pretty cool, and that, that's really the strength of a six-player game of Power Grid, my number three. I don't know. See, this is just like Eclipse. Power Grid's an amazing game, and I have played it with six, and I will never do it again. Hmm. It's just too long. When's the last time you played it with six? Uh, it, it, actually, most of the times we've played it with the group. I haven't played Power Grid, period, in a while. Um, but it in the group, we usually had a, a full complement playing it. Man, six players is like three hours. Hey, I forgot to ask you about that, Eric. You know, we were talking, it was a couple episodes ago, about the the best player count for games. And remember I said something like one less than a number, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. So in your group, your method of picking a game is you pick the game, and then, people can, and then the second person can play in that game or they can pick another game. So let's mm-hmm. say they pick another game. So now people are going back and forth. Yeah. What if I'm playing a five-player game, but it really should be four? And- can I say that? Yeah, yeah, especially if you're the one picking it. So I can say, I'm picking this game, max of four. Right. We, okay. we sort of discuss, if there's two tables, if, if we have, you know, eight people, we try and make it a four and four split, rather, or, or maybe a five and three, if the games will allow for that. I see. But if, if for some reason, you the person picking it, or, or just the group consensus says, we really should not play this at five, we'll try and prevent that from happening. Got it. All right. Just was checking on that. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's uh, where I was at as a power grid. All right. My number three. Oh, I can't even talk about it because it's higher on Eric's list, but I will dethrone him someday. Number two. Number two is Tom's favorite from my list, and that is Imperial. The reason this works well as a six player game is that there are six major powers at the beginning. And uh, you want to have those split up evenly at the beginning so everyone has the ability to, to be in control of one power. If you have fewer, then you're going to end up with sort of an uneven mix. Um, yeah, you, you can play an advanced version where you are bidding for the, uh, the, the stock, the bonds that, that uh, give you control of these powers. But it's good to have it be relatively even at the beginning. And so six players, six powers, good way to start, and then let chaos ensue and begin your investing and uh, you know messing with these territories and tanking them when you no longer when you've already scored your points. Um, I, I really I like Imperial and and having the full complement is is the key to this one. Number two, Imperial. Yeah. See, now Eric's thinking I'm gonna bag on Imperial here. I am thinking that yes. So that's true, but I think that if you're going to play this with a number of players and you want the most miserable experience possible, Hmm. six seems just about it because six can guarantee you the fact that there will be times in the game where you're doing nothing, right? The more players in the game, the higher the chance that you won't control one of the powers. Well, someone will wrestle control, and then that's the moment that you pounce and wrestle control from something else. When's the last time you played this game? Um, I don't know. In the last six months, probably. Hmm. Hmm. When's the last time I played this game? I can't even remember. Well, then then I think I would be the, the better authority on this particular game. Don't use your logic on me, Summer. <laughs> I, that, I mean, you complain about this, this particular situation all the time, but that is part of the game is having control wrestled away from you, and then where do you pounce next? Where do you go when you no longer ha- are in control? Where do you invest? How do you wrestle control f- from someone else? Do you sit back and just quietly invest in everything so that no matter what happens, you're profiting? 
All I know is that this designer has designed many better games, one of which I'll talk about in the next episode. Okay. My number two is Ave Caesar, a racing game in which you always get to take your turn. No, you don't, because sometimes someone will block you. (laughs) It's really annoying, although it lasts for like 30 seconds. Oh. But anyhow, obviously this is a really fun racing game, and this is one I'm surprised is not back in print. I imagine it will be back within print within three years. I'm calling it. Super fun. Great chariot game, and it plays six so very well. The board has a different side of one for three to four players, the other side for five to six, and six players. It's just raucous, lots of blocking, lots of yelling. Good fun. Ave Caesar. And finally, number one. Number one is King of Tokyo. And uh, the reason that it's number one is is for play speed, for one thing. I mean, you want to have the full set of six for this because it's a battle royale. When you're in Tokyo and you attack everybody, it's really cool to attack everybody everybody that's that's cool uh when you're you're playing with only a couple and if it's only two or three people and you're only smacking down one or two folks no you go into tokyo and you fire breath to everybody that's fun um also the combination of different powers everybody sort of develops their their monsters differently uh it, it's just more chaos more fun and uh, and speed really makes this the number one game if you've got six and you want to teach something fast, you want to play something while you're thinking of those uh, those three other threes, uh, the, the three and three games to play when you're going to split up later. This is a great one to play and just smack some folks down. King of Tokyo, my number one six-player game. Yep, yep, yep. I agree with Eric. Good choice there. King of Tokyo. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. There's not a whole lot I can say. So, in fact, I'm trying to remember the last time I played this where it wasn't six players. I play it a lot as a two-player because of my son, and it's it's not nearly as entertaining that way. I, I love doing it, but um, it's much better with six. Oh, so you're not playing with both your sons in this one yet? Uh, you know, I don't think my youngest has played this yet. I should. Mm. I think he's old enough to handle it now. I, I think uh, it he hasn't been around. The last time it was it was on the table, and it was just me and my older son. He wasn't ready yet. I am really, really not trying to pull a summer where I stick my favorite game in every list. But it has to be said, Cosmic Encounter is my favorite game with six players because it is best with six, in my yep. opinion. If we did our top ten four-player games, this would not be on the list. Cosmic Encounter is okay with four. It's good with four, but it's great with six. I love it with six, and I know Eric has continually had bad experiences with the game and it probably doesn't help that we pummel him. I but, did win the last time we played. Yeah, but you didn't like it. I could tell. I, I didn't want to win, but I did it for the group. <laughs> what I mean is you didn't like the game that much. No, I, it's still, I mean, I, 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 it's fine. I, it's just not my style of game. It, it is not. But I love it. I think six is fun because there's more negotiations. With six, you can always try to wheedle yourself in a deal somehow or other. Mm-hmm. You know, if one person won't take you, maybe the other person will. Uh, maybe you'll be forgotten because other things are going on. I don't know. I just find the game most fun with six players. Maybe this won't show up on our next top ten list. We'll have to see. <laughs> maybe. Speaking of which, if you're listening to this, I should mention, before we go on to the contributors, because this just popped in my head now, our next top 10 list is top 10 reprints. If that's confusing to you, I mean games that have been reprinted. So, like, for example, you're like, I really loved the 10-year re- anniversary edition of such and such a game. I really like the deluxe reprint of this game. I really like the second printing of this. It was so much better than the first. That's what I'm talking about. Not games that you wish were reprinted. Okay. All right. Meanwhile, let's see what the contributors think. Hello, this is Ignacy Trzewiczek. And this is Steven Bonico. We are Board Games Insider. And the best game for six players for me is a Quartermaster General from Griggling Games created by Jan Brody. And I'm going to go with Battlestar Galactica, the epic hidden traitor game that uh, I just love that style game. And it is so interesting and so epic every time you play it. Hey, this is Marty from Rolling Dice and Taking Names, and we assume that it's not six-player only games, so for me, I'm going to say code names because six is the minimum you need to really hit the sweet spot of that game where you can have three players on each team. 
Tony, what about you? I'm going to have to go with Seven Wonders, Marty. I just love playing that game with the more the merrier. So six people, that's a sweet spot for me on that game. Jonathan from the Snakes cast. I always feel excited when I'm called over to help a table for six because there's just so much you can do with six people. It's a big enough group to run a party game like Panic on Wall Street or Codenames. It's small enough to run a light strategy game like King of Tokyo or Incan Gold, and it's perfect for social deduction games like Good Cop, Bad Cop. You can even run some heavier stuff like Power Grid and Isla Dorada. But if I'm on my own with five of my friends, the game I'd most love the six of us to play is Dune. So good. This is Brian from Cult of the Old. While Telestrations and Spyfall work well with six, I'm going to go with Shadow Hunters with the expansion. Six just seems to be about the right number, especially when you're going to have a bystander in there. It just increases the paranoia just to the right level. And I think this is quite fun with six. Hi there, it's Luke from the Broken Meeple, and you're going to hear this a little bit later on Tom's list, I would suspect, but I would go with Cosmic Encounter. Five players is good, seven or eight is a bit long, although I have done a really epic eight player before, but six is that nice sweet spot where you've got enough turns and enough allies to go with to keep yourself entertained for what is already a classic negotiation game. Right, Tom, I guess the check is in the mail, right? Uh, Battlestar Galactica was one that I had at least considered, um... Isn't that, that's, if you have six players, that's when you have the possibility of the sympathizer, not the No, that's five players. Okay. With five players, sympathizer can go either direction, I believe. All right. Um, Yeah, BSG was on my short list. I I I considered it. Um, I also considered Seven Wonders. And Dune is best with six. It just didn't make my top ten. Mm-hmm. All right. Also, I like Luke. Let's see what the people said. Number 10, Power Grid. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that many people agree with Eric. (laughs) Number 9, Jamaica. Number 8, Mysterium. Hmm. Number 7, Shadows of Her Camelot. I didn't put that on my list because I like that one best with 7. Yeah. Number 6, Resistance. 6 is a good number for Resistance. Although, (laughs) again, Resistance is one of those games I prefer with an odd number of players. Oh, interesting. Okay. Number five, Battlestar Galactica. Number four, Dixit. Number three, King of Tokyo. Number two, Codenames. And number one, Seven Wonders. Oh, all right. Seven Wonders gets a lot of love. It does. I, I, I don't really see a difference between playing it with six, though, and seven. And so it didn't feel right at this list. I actually like playing Seven Wonders with five, I think. Oh, all right. Well, I like to see my initial hand of cards come back. That is true. That is nice. Maybe so, that's why people like it at six. Yeah, you get the what? You get the you ooh. get that one shot at the that one. <laughs> maybe this one will come back to me. Uh, all right, well, folks, that's another episode. That's a wrap. It is. Yeah. Although, can I put in a plug real quick for for ConCon? I mentioned it earlier. I I will be at uh, ConCon in Stamford, which is middle of March. Uh, I guess it's the eighteenth, nineteenth, twentieth of March. I'm flying back early from Gamma so I can go to ConCon with my my eight-year-old son. It's going to be his first uh, small-scale convention. And uh, I'll be teaching a bunch of games, including Food Chain Magnate, uh, Time Stories, Tiny Epic Galaxies, and Clask. Um, so, you know, check out ConCon.com if you're interested. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 447, was recorded on February 25th, 2016. Coming up next week, if you could go back in time to snag any game you wanted from the past, what would it be? Find out what our contributors have to say. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with production assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Anger at the subpar quality of domestic American lager provided by Bud Rage. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Email us at TheDiceTower at gmail.com or follow us on Facebook. 
And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including the Out of Game Podcast, 20 Minutes of Filler, the Pusher Luck Podcast, the D6 Generation, the Geek All Stars, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, and Dice Tower Showdown at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So, should, you know, we should do a tally of how many times Cosmic Encounter is in your top 10 list and how many times Merchant of Venus is in my top 10 lists. And just, just, just for comparison purposes at the end of the year. That would be interesting. Oh, you mean just doing one year's worth? Yeah, you know. I think it's easy for you to say that because I think you have a zero to three lead there. I know. I, well, I, I would I'd be playing to an advantage and I, I don't think I should be blamed for that. Well, that's not very sporting of you. I need an ally here against Eric. 